Hi everybody! So today our presentation will cover the biology and migratory patterns of the shortfin mako shark. First, we will cover some relevant aspects of its biology and then explain how they're tagged and how the mako migrates. Before we discuss the biology of the shortfin mako shark, here's a picture of the body so you can understand their anatomy and their shape um, while taking in the information as I'm telling it to you. As you can see, they have a torpedo-like body and a pointed snout that allows the mako to pierce through the water and its crescent-shaped tail propels it through the water at top speeds. The mako shark inhabits the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, and their lifespan is above 30 years or more, and their length can be up to 13 feet and weigh as much as 1,200 pounds. They are found from the Gulf of Mexico to the coast of New England and in the Caribbean as well and they are a highly migratory species and can travel across entire oceans. They can't reproduce until they're about 8 years old for males and 19 years old for females, which means they have a 3 year like window for reproduction, which means they can mate um, any time in that 3 years. And mating occurs from summer to fall and their eggs are fertilized internally and develop inside the mother. Currently, their population is significantly below their target level and their fishing status was reduced to prevent overfishing in all three of their inhabited areas. The shortfin mako uh, diet includes squid and bony fish like bonitos, tuna, and swordfish, but they can also eat other sharks, um, sea turtles, and porpoises. So some swimming and quick facts about the mako um, is the mako can reach speeds up to 45 miles an hour, making it the fastest shark in our oceans and one of the fastest fish on the planet. Their body is extremely agile, allowing the mako to hunt from below and making vast leaps out of the water to catch their prey, um, kind of like great whites. And makos can, quote, cruise at a speed of 4.2 miles per hour, which is great for long and short distances. These animals utilize their torpedo-like body to prevent excessive um, yaw movement through the water in contrast to the other slow-moving sharks, and their strong tail strokes propel them forward quickly. The following video I'm going to show you guys demonstrates some of the mako swimming adaptations and how their body excels at speed and agility compared to other sharks. So how is the mako so good at both short spurts and long distances? First, the mako doesn't utilize the wavy swimming pattern seen in most sharks. Instead, a smooth, powerful tail stroke pushes the mako forward more efficiently. Second, the mako's muscle is specialized to quickly take in oxygen, allowing it to recover twice as fast as other sharks. Third, makos contract heat in some body parts. Warmer organs and muscle means better performance. No wetsuit required. Finally, the mako's conical snout is optimal for piercing the water and its crescent-shaped tail pushes it forward with less resistance, making it one of the top winners in the water when it wants to range and race. All right, and now Salt Knot's gonna talk to you guys about the tagging of the mako shark. What does it mean when a shark is tagged? Satellite tracking tags send a signal every time the shark's spin breaks the water surface and the transmitter sends the data straight to the satellite receiver. These tags are attached to the dorsal fin of a shark while the shark is held beside the boat. The shark can then be followed for the life of the tag battery. Here is a picture of the uh, satellite tag and I have a very quick um, short video on uh, the process of how it's done. So here is a shark and a prey. He catches the prey and then um, he gets tagged. This is pretty much it, and next slide is benefits of shark tagging. Tagging sharks allow researchers to obtain valuable real-time data regarding their natural behavior. This study helps determine the movement patterns of mako sharks in order to better understand their abundance, when, where they use coastal habitats, what distances they migrate, where they migrate to, and where they are distributed. Mako shark tracking in Southern California. Researchers tagged 105 mako sharks over 12 years from 2002 and 2014. The tags record the sharks' movements as well as environments the sharks pass through. 
the largest effort ever to tag and track dwarfing mako sharks off the west coast has found that they can travel nearly 12,000 miles in a year, according to a recent article on the NOAA uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website. Mako sharks travel far across the Pacific and return to the same coastal areas between Santa Barbara South to San Diego, known as the Southern California Bight. Researchers have long recognized that these ocean waters are important feeding areas for mako sharks. Tagged mako sharks return there annually, most typically in summer, when the waters are most productive. Large numbers of juvenile sharks caught in the Southern California Bight indicate that it is also a nursery area for the species. The um, tracks of the tagged sharks may look at first like random zigzag, um, zigzags across the ocean, but they actually illustrate the sharks searching for food and mates based on what they remember from previous years. Researchers say the more we look at the data, the more we find that there is a pattern behind their movements. Sharks tracked over multiple years return to the same offshore neighborhoods year after year. The findings demonstrate an impressive show of memory and navigation. I have an illustration here that uh, shows a roughly Seven feet female mako shark mm -hmm. followed similar courses into the Pacific and back to the um, California coast over three consecutive years. The black dashed line indicates the first year, yellow line indicates the second year, and red line indicates the third year, with um, the colored dots along each line indicating months of the year. The tagging data overall reveal that the sharks travel widely along the west coast. They venture as far north as Washington, as far south as Baja California, and westward across the Pacific as far as Hawaii. The researchers used two types of shark, um, tags to track the sharks, one type called pop-up tag that collects data and eventually pop off the animal and flow to the surface where they transmit the, um, their data via satellite, and the second type it transmits data to satellites each time. The shark surfaces determining the animal's location by measuring tiny shifts in the frequency of the radio transmission. It also tagging indicates that 90% of the time, the shark remains on the top 160 feet of ocean, but occasionally dive as deep as uh, 2,300 feet. Makos mainly stay in the areas with sea surface temperatures between about 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And this slide is uh, is a screenshot from osearch.org showing us data as of May 3rd, 2021, about the location of tagged Atlantic mako sharks. We found 29 mako sharks that were mainly concentrated in the Gulf of Mexico. Sharks navigate mainly by electroreception and sensitivity to pressure and water temperature. Sharks have little pores on their face called ampullae of Lorenzini that power their electrosensory system, helping them detect electrical currents in the water. They also have a lateral line system that helps them detect pressure variations and vibrations in the water. Sharks have a strong sensitivity to water temperature. The migrations are timed by different seasons of the year when the water temperatures change, and they may also want to migrate to breeding grounds within their preferred water temperature range. Mako sharks can tolerate lower temperatures because they have a higher metabolic rate, which allows them to generate their own heat. Sharks can also migrate to follow their food sources because the fish they prey on can also migrate to stay in their own preferred temperature ranges of water. Recently, as of May 2021, new studies have been found proving that sharks use the Earth's magnetic fields to navigate through the ocean. Save Our Seas Foundation project leader Brian Keller, who executed the research in Florida, decided to study wild-caught bonnethead sharks. Here is a short video explaining a little bit of the process of this discovery. They exposed 20 wild-caught sharks to magnetic conditions similar to locations that were hundreds of miles away from the area they had been caught and the sharks were able to find their bearings. Save Our Seas Foundation project leader Professor Brian Keller said this demonstrates that the sharks know where home is and can navigate back to it from a distant location. Keller went on to say, in a world where people use GPS to navigate almost everywhere, this ability is truly remarkable. 
The most common factor affecting migration is predation. Since sharks are the most successful predators in the ocean, their only enemies are other sharks and humans. However, in recent decades, humans continue to be the most significant predators affecting shark survival. Sharks are fished commercially for their valuable fins, which are used in traditional Chinese shark fin soup. Finning is when the fins are cut from the shark's body while the shark is still alive, and then the finless shark is thrown back into the ocean to die slowly. Although this practice is illegal in most areas, poaching continues to support black markets. Beach nets are another factor affecting the migration success of other kinds of sharks. These nets are used to protect swimmers along the South African and Australian coastlines from sharks. Makos do not approach the shore close enough to become entangled in these nets, but coastal sharks, as well as many other marine animals, get caught in these nets and perish. Next up, Craig is going to go a little bit more in depth about migration. Although the short fin mako shark is found worldwide, the research we looked at focused on the movements of the short fin mako sharks migrating throughout the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic Ocean. The sharks explored parts of the Sargasso Sea, the Caribbean, and of course, the Gulf Stream. Several tagging studies found that the sharks in the Gulf of Mexico frequently stayed over the continental shelves and showed some fidelity to particular areas of the Gulf of Mexico. This could be due to a number of factors such as temperature, mating season, or food availability. If these sharks do leave the Gulf of Mexico, they eventually migrate back to the Gulf in the winter months, most likely due to stay in warmer temperatures. The sharks tracked in the North Atlantic migrate farther than the ones who remain in the Gulf of Mexico. These sharks migrate during the springtime to continental shells along the mid-Atlantic states, similarly to how the Gulf of Mexico sharks stay on the continental shells. In the summer and the fall, these sharks migrate north towards Canada. Then in the winter, they once again return to the Gulf Stream, most likely due to temperature. In conclusion, these amazing creatures migrate throughout the ocean and are still not completely understood. Researchers are using the tagging technology available to them to understand these creatures and their migratory patterns. A better understanding of these sharks will aid in the management and protection of these amazing organisms.